Welcome to lecture 7.2, Different Boundary Conditions. So last time we had an initial and boundary value problem for the heat equation, something like this. And let's recall what that model and roughly how we approached it. So we had a, a bar of length pi, made the math a little bit easier. And it was insulated on the endpoints, and it was stuck in a room that was zero degrees, and the initial temperature was given by this parabola. And so heat would escape over time, and a few minutes later, the, oops, the temperature would look something like this, and then it would die up more and eventually approach zero degrees. So recall how we, how we solved this. We said, well, let's, let's assume that u of x t separates f of x times g of t, and then we, we plug this thing back in, and figure out what f and g were. So this time, I'm going to show you a very simpler, not, sorry, it's not simpler, similar, similar PDE. Just we have boundary conditions equal to 32 instead of 0. So some would argue that it's really the same problem. It's just you're calling it 0 versus 32. It's almost as if you're in a you know, Fahrenheit, or Fahrenheit versus Celsius, though. I'm going to ignore the, the scaling factor of the 9 fifths. So we have the same bar. But now, our heat is pumped up to 32 degrees. So if I were to graph that the initial condition, it looks like, like this. And of course, over time, it's going to just die off. Okay, And you can probably guess that the solution to this equation is just going to be this thing here, plus 32. right? You just take this thing, and you shift it up by 32. So, so right away, we know that the, that the solution is going to be n equals 1 to infinity of 4, 1 minus negative 1 to the n over pi n cubed times sine of nx times e to the minus c squared n squared t plus 32. And the 32, that's not in the sum. That's, that's outside of the sum. So... These boundary conditions are actually called inhomogeneous boundary conditions. And you can think of this, you can think of this as that's the steady state solution, right? That's where the, the temperature of the bar is the same temperature of the room. So that this is the steady state solution, which is a solution. It's a particular solution. And you can think of this as being the homogeneous solution. A solution where the boundary conditions are homogeneous. And that's, in fact, how we're going to solve this. We don't need to redo that whole process we did up here. We're just going to shift up our solution by 32. So I'm giving you a preview as to where this is going. Um, so, um, and I claim that if you actually try to do the process you did up here, you'll fail. And here's why. This Zero boundary condition was very important. Recall that we had, here's how we used it. We used u of, of 0 t equals f of 0 g of t. And we said that that was equal to 0. And from that, well, we had, we had a function of time times a number being 0. That meant that our function, sorry, our number, f of 0 equals 0. And similarly, we concluded that f of pi was 0. Well, what if that 0 had been 32? So you have a function of time, which we actually know is like an exponential function now, times a number being 32. That, that's not going to work. That's not possible. So, so we would get stuck if we try to do this. And actually, looking back at this, it, it, this solution, this, this is not a function. or. This is not a function of x times a function of t. I mean, I mean um, well, of course, nor is this. This is a sum of functions, but this is not a sum of functions of x times functions of t, because we have that 32 right here. OK, so, um, so what do we do? Well, I'm going to make a, a substitution. I'm going to say, let's let v be a function of x and t. And I'm going to let it be u 
minus 32. So let's, let's take this and let's just pretend that 32 is 0. We, we did this in the first series of lectures when we had um, the temperature of a cup of coffee in a room that was 72. We said, well, let's, let's define, remember that? We said, let's, let's let y be, no, we didn't say y. We said, yeah, yeah, we said, let y be t minus 72. We plugged back in and made the equation homogeneous. Same thing here. We're going to plug this back into here. It's going to make this homogeneous. So if this is v, then vt is just ut. If you take a t derivative of, of this, it's the same thing as the t derivative of this. Similarly, we get that v xx equals uxx. Now let's look at the boundary conditions. So v of 0t is u of 0t minus 32 equals 0. And similarly, v of pi t is by definition u of pi t minus 32, which is 0. So these are the boundary conditions. And now let's look at the initial condition. So u of, well not u, I, I want v, v of x0 equals u of x0 minus 32, so that's this thing minus 32, which is x pi minus x. So what do we get? We have a PDE. We have vt equals c squared u, not u, vxx. Oops, not very good at this. Vxx. We have boundary conditions. We have v of 0 t equals v of pi t equals 0. And we have an initial condition, v of x 0 equals x pi minus x. What do you notice? This is identical to that. So in other words, v is this thing right here. So v of x t equals, equals 1 to infinity of 4, 1 minus negative 1 to the n over pi n cubed times sine of n x e to the minus c squared n squared t. And so if that's v, u is v plus 32. So u, um, our u in this equation is v x t plus 32. And I'm not going to actually write that out again, but um, our, our u that satisfied this, this condition is just this thing plus 32, and that's, that's what we said right up here. So actually, I did write this. Um, it's, it's right up there. So let me, let me point there is our solution. So, of course, it came back again. The solution to an inhomogeneous equation, that's a little more subtle what that is here, is the homogeneous solution plus the particular solution. Okay, so here's the next example, 1c, and let's compare it to, again, the example from the previous lecture. So let's, let me redraw that. So we have a bar of length pi, and we have insulation along the sides, so he can only go left and right. And we have, let's say we have big ice packs on the left-hand side and the right-hand side that are zero degrees, and initially the temperature looks like this, and we want to know what happens over time. So obviously heat is going to dissipate, um, and it's going to approach the steady state solution of zero, and this is what we solved. There is our solution. Now we have a similar um, initial and boundary value problem for the heat equation, but the endpoints are different. 
So let me draw this this time. So this is 0 and this is pi. And let's suppose that, um, again, the, there's an insulation along the boundary. But now we have an ice pack, which makes the left side 32 degrees and the right side 42 degrees. So initially, the, the heat um, is, what is this? So 32 minus 10x over pi, what, is, what does that mean? So that if we have a, suppose we have this graph, obviously not to scale. Um, so suppose we have a linear function like that, then, then this function is, is that. This line is um, 32 plus 10 over pi times x. And it's not unreasonable to see why this is, this is a steady state solution to this equation. So if initially your temperature is zero, there's 32 degrees, and not initially, at the left end point it's 32, and the right end point it's, it's 42. So here's our initial, our initial condition is just this parabola that's bumped up by this line. So there's this line right here. Then what's going to happen over time? Well, the heat's going to dissipate. Right, and it's going to approach the steady state solution. So this is going to be this. Um, this is the steady state solution. Oops, let's let's put put an S. Let's call it. And it's this line, which is thirty two plus ten over pi x. So let's write that down. Um, steady state is the limit as t goes to infinity of u of x t not, not this u but, but the u down here that we haven't solved yet and we know that, that that's going to be 32 plus 10 over pi x. It, it makes sense, right? If, if we have a Ice pack here that's 32 and an ice pack here that's 42. Eventually, the heat's going to linearly increase from 32 to 42. Now, we also know that, um, or not surprisingly, that the general solution for this equation is going to be the steady state solution plus the homogeneous solution. I'm putting the steady state solution first so we can tell that it's, it's not inside of the sum. And so that's, that's going to be 32 plus 10 over pi x plus n equals 1 to infinity of 4 times 1 minus negative 1 to the n over pi n cubed sine of nx e to the minus c squared n squared t. So we just know that this is going to be the general solution. And I mean, it makes sense, right? We're just, this, this thing here is not, nothing more than just this bumped up by this line. And let's actually verify that. This is like what we did last time. Let's define, um, define or let V of x t be u minus the steady state solution. So in other words, that's, that's u minus um, 32 minus 10 over pi times x. Okay, so um, let's plug this back, change variables, plug back in and see what happens. Um, so ut, not ut, vt. So vt, um, take ddt of, of this thing, and that's just, well, those are constants with respect to t, so we just get ut. So, and then if we take vxx, well, one x derivative of this 
actually, um, the 32 goes away. This does not. This becomes a constant. But if we take two derivatives of this, both of these terms go away, and vxx equals uxx. And now the boundary conditions, v of 0, t equals u of 0, t minus 32 minus 10 over pi times x. So we took this thing minus that, and absolutely we get um, x pi minus x. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's, um, that's not right. Wait. So th this is right, but um, what did I do wrong? Oh, okay, yeah, at, at x equals 0, x, that's 0, so we get this minus 32. And so what was that? That's 32 minus 32. Good. Which is 0. And v of pi t equals u of pi t minus um, this thing at, at 10, which is 42, minus 42, which is 0. And then this condition is going to be similar. V of, I actually almost did that one, V of 0, or x0, is x of pi minus. So it's, it's this thing minus off that thing again. So that's that. So what we get is the... So the PDE in V is exactly this PDE up here. And so our solution U of XT, which I guess I have up here, is V of XT plus um, plus the steady state solution. And that is exactly what I have written right there. So as a summary, to solve the, the initial and boundary value problem for the heat equation with inhomogeneous coefficients, first solve the related homogeneous problem by subtracting off the steady state solution, and then just add this to the steady state solution, which is always going to be this here. And where does this come from? That just comes from the fact that if you have a and you have um, pi and you have b, then this, this line here is going to be a plus b minus a over pi. That's the slope times x. So as before, not surprisingly, the general solution is always going to be the, I guess it could be the, yeah, the particular solution, given these boundary and initial conditions, is always going to be the homogeneous solution plus the steady state solution. And by, oops, not, that's not an H, that should be a T. And by definition, the steady state solution is, um, is the limit. So if you take the limit as T goes to infinity, of what I just wrote above, then this is going to go to zero. All those exponential functions kill off that initial wave and you're just going to get the steady state solution. It's going to be a function of x. So notice, as I said before, this is the first time we've seen a steady state solution that is not constant, but what's important is it's not a function of time. Okay, so here's our next and last example in this lecture. I'm calling this example 2 because it's, it's different enough from examples 1, a, b, and c that it warrants this new number. So it's the same thing as before, except we have a slightly different boundary condition here. Now instead of the temperature being zero at the endpoints, the rate of change of temperature is zero at the endpoints. So let's sketch what, what that looks like. So let me draw the, the bar. I'm going to draw with an axis just sort of for reference. And now before, our bar was insulated along the side, so he could only escape through the endpoints. But now he cannot escape through the endpoints because the rate of change, think of this as, as flux. Um, and this is the rate of change in the x direction. So that means heat does not pass through the endpoint. The endpoints might change with respect to time and temperature, but heat does not pass through. So that means that we have insulated endpoints, something like this. 
Last time our endpoints were open, now they're not. And here we have the same initial condition. So we still have initial heat and like that. And let's think of what happens as, as time goes on. Actually, let me write down U of XT, of course, is the temperature of the bar at position X and time T. <clears throat> and just using our intuition, what is this? What is the limit? What is the limiting temperature? As T goes to infinity of U of T. What's that going to be? So over, over time, the heat's going to dissipate and flat out, but it can't ever escape the bar. So a few minutes later, it's going to look like, like that. And then it's going to end up at a constant temperature, which should be the average value. Where have we seen that before? Think Fourier series. That makes sense, right? That the heat's going to average out. So I'm, I'm going to say um, average temperature of average value of this. Okay, so let's do the same thing we did before. So, so step one always is um, assume that u of x t equals f of x g of t. And now we're going to plug this back into here and separate variables. Um, and solve for f and g. So ut, same as before, f of x times g prime of t, and then uxx equals f double prime of x g of t. No difference there. Um, a lot of this is going to be the same as before, just with slight changes. So this is a little bit different. Let's look at these boundary conditions. These are our zero boundary conditions, as I like to call them. So ux of zero t, that's f prime of zero times g of t is zero. And again, this is a number times a non-zero function. That number better be zero. So f prime of zero better be zero. And similarly, ux of pi t is f prime of pi g of t equals zero. This is a function times a number. That number better be zero. So f prime of pi equals zero. Okay, so as before, um, we have this. We have ut and ux as before. So we plug it back in. So let's say step Step two, plug in, and we get, so let's see, um, <clears throat> ut equals c squared uxx. That equals c squared times that. So f times g prime equals c squared times f double prime. Let's make sure that looks like a double prime. Double prime times g. So let's divide both sides by c squared fg. That's, remember, always my recommendation, c squared fg. And then the f's cancel, the c squared's cancel, and the g's cancel. And we get, what do we get? We get g prime over, let's make sure that's, that's a prime and not a 2. So g, g prime over c squared g equals f double prime over f. And as before, this is a function of time. This is independent of x. This is independent of t. Therefore, it is a constant. It is lambda. Okay, so now we get two equations as before. The first one, we get um, g prime equals c squared lambda g. And the next one we get is f double prime equals lambda f. And we have not just this equation, but this boundary value problem with these two initial conditions. So we have f prime of 0 equals f of 0, not f of, f prime of 0 equals f prime of pi equals 0. 
This is a boundary value problem. We have seen these in the end of the section six lectures. And recall that, so this is a different boundary value problem because we have derivatives here. So the solution to this one, well, we also had lambda be negative n squared, but fn of x is cosine, cosine of nx. <clears throat> So let me circle that. So this thing here, solving for g now, let's, we can write the lambda as negative n squared. So that's negative c squared n squared g. This is an ODE. And its solution, this is just exponential decay. This is the same thing as before. We've only changed things. We've only changed the boundary value problem. We've only changed the x part of this. So it's not surprising that the function for g is going to be exactly the same, because that hasn't changed. So the ODE is going to be, the solution is g of t. Actually, let me, let me write it as g n of t. So we have one for each n is um, e to the negative c squared n squared t. And here, I think, unlike the last time, I didn't actually put constants. Before, I put a n in front of here and b n in front of here. I'm just going to leave it like this because we're, we're going to do superposition later. We know this is a solution. That's a solution. So, of course, you can multiply that by a constant. So, what this means is that for, um, for each, each um, n equals 0, 1, 2, we have a solution, wn, not w, un of xt equals um, cosine of nx times e to the minus c squared n squared, uh, like n squared t. Okay? So we have a solution like, like that. And by superposition, let's write that down, super. By superposition, we can add up any linear combination of these things and still get a solution. So um, u of x t equals, I'm going to leave a little bit of space here. I'll explain why in a moment. n equals 1 to infinity of a n cosine of n x times e to the minus c squared n squared t. I'm going to use a n instead of b n now because that's usually what we, what goes along with cosine. So now I started at 1, but I said n equals 0, we have a solution. So previously, when n equals 0, uh, we didn't have a, we just had the 0 solution. It was, well, that's 1, and then sine of nx was sine of 0, x is 0. But now, when n equals 0, this is a, cos, this is a constant as before, and this is, a, this is 1. So we actually have a constant, non-zero constant solution. So I could start this from 1 to infinity and call it, and, but instead, I'm going to call our constant solution a naught over 2. Because why the heck not? I can call it whatever I want to. So now that matches, it looks more like a Fourier series. So this is our, this is our general solution. Several things. What happens as time goes to infinity? When time gets larger and larger, so this exponential thing acts as a damper. It kills off these initial cosine waves, and we're left with a naught over 2. So let me call a naught over 2. And that's a naught over 2 we know is the average value. And absolutely, that's, that makes sense that the temperature is going to approach the average value, which is a naught over 2. Okay, so the next slide, all we have to do is we have to solve this initial value problem. So we will plug 0 into here, set it equal to this. Let's think of what's going to happen. Set it equal to this. And now we're going to get a cosine series that equals this function here. And so we have to take the Fourier cosine series, and then we're done. So to summarize, we had the following boundary value problem for the heat equation. Here's the heat equation. We had these boundary conditions. That gave us... Um, a I should say that that modeled a bar of length pi that was insulated 
along the interior. And there's also insulation at the endpoint, so heat cannot escape. Um, so this is the general solution to that boundary condition. We have not yet used any initial conditions, so this um, encapsulates all possible initial conditions that we could prescribe. So with this initial condition, that gives us an initial temperature distribution of something like that. And we know over time, this is going to balance out and approach the, the average value. Um, but let's, let's actually figure out what these ANs are. So we need to plug in T as before. So plug in T equals zero. So when we do that, what happens? The exponentials become one. So we get A naught over two plus, plus one to infinity, A N cosine of N X. And we have to set that equal to X pi minus X. Plug in zero, set it equal to this. Now th this is a uh, parabola as before. So if we were to plot it, it looks like, okay, like this, and it would, and so a parabola is not going to be equal to a sum of cosines unless we take the Fourier cosine series. So we have to take Fourier cosine series. In other words, we got to make take this function down here and make it even, and then we got to make that periodic. Okay, so the Fourier cosine series. Um, now, a couple lectures ago, I did the Fourier sine series of this function. I don't think I did the Fourier cosine series. I'll just tell you what it is. Um, so, um, a naught is pi. I'll just tell you the definition. And I'll tell you what the integrals evaluate to. Pi, um, oh, it's not pi over 2. It's 2 over pi. I'm sorry. 2 over pi times the integral from 0 to pi of x pi minus x dx. And this turns out to be pi squared over 3. And then a n is 2 over pi times the integral from 0 to pi of x pi minus x times cosine of nx dx. And this turns out to be 2 times 1 minus negative 1 to the n over n squared. Okay, so that means that this function here, written in a Fourier sine series, is a naught over 2, so that's pi squared over 6, plus the sum of this creature, over n squared, that's a negative sign, um, cosine of nx. So this function, we have to write it in a cosine series like this, and its Fourier cosine series is this. Therefore, this, these coefficients better be the same, and the constant terms better be the same as well. Otherwise, we, these are different functions. So both of these are equal. So that um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what these things are, what, what a n is and what a naught, and we just did. So let's write this down. Our, our particular solution to the original boundary value problem and initial value problem is u of x t. So it's pi squared over 6 plus n equals 1 to infinity. Now, all we have to plug in is, is an, so it's, it's this guy. Um, 2 times 1 minus negative 1 to the n over n squared times cosine of nx times e to the minus c squared n squared t. Okay, so this is our final solution, and let's say a few words about that. So, as I said before, what happens when we take, take the limit of this as t goes to infinity? Let's, let's write that up, up here. So, we take the limit as t goes to infinity of u 
xt. So every one of these exponential terms kills off every cosine term. And what's left is pi squared over 6. It's pi squared over 6. And that makes sense. That is the average, average temperature initially. So to compare, when we had these von Neumann boundary conditions, the type 2, when we controlled the rate of change of the, of the temperature of the endpoints, we get cosines. In the previous lecture, and earlier in this lecture, when we had the type 1 boundary conditions, the Dirichlet, we could control the temperature at the endpoints. In that case, we got sine waves instead of cosine waves. So at each endpoint, you can either have it one way but not both. You can, you can either decide to put a cap on it so heat cannot escape, or you can um, fix it. You can open it up and, and fix it at a certain temperature. Uh, and I'll leave you as an exercise, I think I put this on a worksheet, to solve a PDE like this when the boundary conditions are mixed. So when you have one endpoint that is open, like it's zero degrees here, and then the right endpoint is capped off. So I'll leave that as an exercise for you.